Historia Canadiana is recorded on the unceded lands of the Kanyankaheka First Nation. Hello everyone and welcome to Historia Canadiana, the show where apparently one of us can take random trips to Bermuda. So that's Ayo. fun. <laughs> Yeah, my, all, my audio quality is going to be in the dumpster for this episode. Hey, we hear you, and you don't sound like you're that much in a tin can, so it's fine. Oh, I'm in an aluminum can, that's why. <laughs> sorry, sorry, for our British listeners, aluminium can. Nice. Is that really how they say it? Yes. That's atrocious. I'm in the rubbish bin. Oh, that, that's fine. I use that sometimes. <laughs> aluminum. <laughs> aluminum. <laughs> so, um, before we get started... As always, we always like to thank our patrons, right? Craig, Jessica, Elise, Tommy, James, you're all super appreciated. And if you want to join them um, in getting an extra episode a month uh, with Pop Canada led by Mac and access to early episodes of the show, um, like this one, you can join for as little as $1 a month or up to $3 a month um, on Patreon. You can also just donate a one-time thing to the show, as some listeners have done in the past, and that's totally appreciated as well. Every little thing helps. It helps send Mac to Bermuda. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> And remember, if you're interested, our late we have some free episodes of Pop Canada on Spotify. That's true. Every and I always put up a preview. Yeah. yeah, we'll always put out a preview. Like I think the very first episode, which is still one of our best, is up on Spotify somewhere. There you go. We peaked at the first we peaked episode. Cirque du Soleil. <laughs> because we're a fucking joke. We're just a couple of clowns. Exactly. Um, so yeah, today. We're going to be talking about the second the mental image of us just dressed as clowns making fun of Johnny McDonald now, just like throwing a pie in his face. <laughs> God, that should be like a logo for us now. Oh yeah, like that once Pop Canada, if Pop Canada ever stops, we'll just kind of segue into making fun of various prime ministers on the show, creating our oh, own fanfic. Cracking and stuff an egg like on, head, on the head of Trudeau. <laughs> Right, I'm down. I'm totally okay Pushing with that. Pushing him down the stairs. <laughs> there was a show I was listening to the other day that was saying, like, you know, what would be really fun is a kind of like animated television show wherein the main villain is Stephen Harper, and he has to every prime minister has to fight Stephen Harper throughout time, and if they lose against him, he takes over their body. <laughs> and, and actually, like, runs the show for four years. Why, Stephen? Is he really the worst we've had? Yes. Possibly. Yeah. Yeah, people we hear complaining about Trudeau really don't know what people went through in the Harper days. <laughs> I mean, that's something... So, today... Like that video, the one about the Canada falling apart? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Saying, like, the liberal propaganda silencing journalism. Meanwhile, like... the Stephen Harper administration is sitting there like, um... I'm not going to contradict that, but <laughs> yeah. So today we're going to actually be talking about our second prime minister, right? A certain Alexander Mackenzie. Expect a million jokes from our co-host today. So if you're not interested- My politics, my economic policies, my views on liberalism. Mm -hmm. Yep. 19th century liberalism to be precise. <laughs> Woo! Um, so yeah, this is- like a not a super well-known prime minister. And I think in the grand scheme of things, he's perhaps well-known insofar as he was one of the first. But I don't think people are very much aware of his policies because he was there for a relatively short period of time and was basically there as an interim leader for like, he started off as that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then in between two John A. McDonald uh, tenures, right? He was kind of a stopgap. And we'll get into why that... Um, that was but yeah i just thought it would be a good time to actually talk about our second pm because we're kind of there in the chronology of our show and we recently talked about the indian act which came up under his government we're not going to be talking much about it today just because we did a full episode on the indian act and there are other things that are coming up in later episodes like the creation of the northwest police uh, northwest mounted police that were also under his government and that i think would actually be interesting as a full episode as well um so similar to the john a mcdonald episode we're going to actually be looking at caricatures throughout um and just talk a little bit about what 
uh, what we think he did, uh, whether it's good or not. And I think it would be kind of interesting to start ranking the PMs as we go through them. <laughs> Every time we get a PM, where do they go on the scale? Yeah, like where did they go on the scale? So to answer your question about Stephen Harper, I don't know if he's the worst. We'll see by 2060, by the time we finish, we get to Stephen Harper, um, whether or not he was the worst. Possibly not. Probably mm, not. He's probably in the bottom five, though. I would... I would guess so. I mean, well, let's let's think about it this way. Yeah, the Canadian gas price problems and such. You can link that pretty strongly back to Harper. You can say that that's that's an after effect of Harper still in still in play. In that se- in that sense, yeah. But also, we went through major oil crises in the seventies under the first Trudeau government. Yep. As well. So, you know, similar yep. times, I guess. No, but I guess our, our, I'm saying is our dependency. Yes. Okay. That sense. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Trudeau didn't cause like, we're really de- like our dependency on oil for the Canadian econ- economy very much linked to Harper. Right. Okay. No, I get that. <laughs> so I guess to kick us off, because we've, we've talked a few times on this show about conservatism in Canada through the likes of... Ooh, conservative party! Right. So we've talked about like McDonald, obviously Best we party. did two full episodes. <laughs> sure. Um, and mm-hmm. we talked about... The communist to agree with me. Yay. <laughs> You're really going to reinforce that one, aren't you? Yes, sorry. I keep distracting you from the information. It's all good for for, for a quick update. Apparently, Max Mom thinks I'm a communist, so that's kind of fun. I mean, like, you know, is, she very, is she super wrong? I, I lean left. I am more left-leaning, but I don't know if I would consider myself a communist, a full-on communist. But anyway, point is, we haven't really ever talked specifically about what liberalism looked like in Canada, right? Mm-hmm. We've kind of touched upon it in roundabout ways to people who might be more liberal leading, like we were talking about Alexander McLaughlin, but we've never actually talked about specifically what that meant. Right? Well, it's also what makes it Canadian. Every, every country's definition of liberalism is going to be a little bit different, you know? Right. The old That's joke is that Canada's, Canada's middle is America's left, you know? You're right. <laughs> and... It's kind of similar here. So as we might expect, liberalism at the time that we're talking here, so the 1870s, is not the same as liberals today, right? I don't think in many, well, maybe um, Trudeau is not the same liberal as Alexander Mackenzie was. Mm -hmm. And we'll kind of see this. So I'm kind of curious, do you have any sense of what liberalism was in the 19th century, broadly speaking, or... Um. I, I have, I mean, just looking at the word liberal, I can have ideas. Mm-hmm. I have no claim of knowledge or studying, but I can like take a guess at what it would have meant, you know? Go for it. We're nothing if not a show that just shoots in the dark. Yeah. See what happens. I mean, take a well, the word liberal. Mm-hmm. liberty as another base word, same situation, you know? So if you're looking at that kind of root and that kind of connection between just words at a grammatical level, it would be point of freedom almost or a point of letting people live a certain way absolutely so that's a major component um so historically speaking the liberal like the liberalism that we have here in canada is very much informed by um british liberal traditions but Mm -hmm. as might be expected considering the nature of our history there's also a bit of french and american liberalism uh kind of mixed in there as well We're not going to go into the details of what each of those different strands kind of brought up. For the purposes here, historically speaking, liberalism identified with kind of a middle class bourgeoisie, Mm -hmm. and they actively rejected um, aristocratic or theological institutions, right? And they emphasized, as you were saying, the rights of the individual. Yeah, and that's... Like that's we still track that with liberalism of today. Yeah, you know, liberalism in Canada still represents very much a middle ground in politics, where you don't want the government on top of you, mm-hmm. but you don't want the corporations on top of you either. Exactly, the, that's the idea. That's the, that's the idea in principle, right? But again, yeah. like this is where you see somewhat of a shift. Is like you see this more this idea of like no government oversight does kind of line up, at least here in Canada, more with what you would imagine the conservatives to be now, mm-hmm. right? Um, whereas a lot of a lot of the Liberal Party does tend to veer at least a bit more into government oversight, at least today. Well, it depends, again, if you're looking sure. into a social or economic perspective. Of you course. know, socially speaking, I think people 
take a little bit more of a left approach. Mm-hmm. Like they want government oversight to, to squash, to crush down on things like racism, homophobia, xenophobia, things like that. Yeah. But then can, economically, I find people will always have a part of them that's conservative. The oh, idea of, of saving money, the idea of they get to do what they want with their money, that does, mm-hmm. they worked for it, it shouldn't get taken away from them, you know? Yeah. At least that's what I found in Canada. Like a lot of, that's what I found in a lot of, liberal people is they're fine with the government being involved in the social values because that needs the oversight because Canada has a history of those problems, yeah. aka the church running free reign on social values and running amok and causing who do problems. Sure, sure. But it also still carries that American, uh, the North American dream of building your own self, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Again, the individuality. The individual, I think the, the that element of individuality really is the focus in this case. Um, and the element of like anti-aristocracy anti-arist- uh, does play a role in it, specifically the theological element. You'll see it rise, or the anti-theocratic element does uh, play more of a role in Quebec. Oh, yeah. Because C- Quebec has been traditionally a bit more attached to the Catholic sure. Church and all that for a variety of reasons. When liberalism mm-hmm. does arise in Quebec or the Rouge, as they were called, the Parti Rouge, um, Parti Rouge. like that's where the, 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 they'll be a bit more focused on anti clericalism. Mm-hmm. Um, Which, in my opinion, is always good. Separation of church and state is. Yep. Okay with me. <laughs> and that's that's kind of what's interesting with liberalism in Canada and right and where the American element kind of comes in as well is that so we we have the like, the idea of loyalists, right? American loyalists mm-hmm. that came up during the American Revolution and you can debate for a long time as to how much of an actual impact they had. Mm-hmm. But a lot of these settlers, right, that came in were attached to the crown, right, in many ways. That's one of the main reasons why people stayed in Canada rather than in the U.S. They still wanted to have that attachment to the British ideal, right? And so what's interesting is that while Americans brought the sense of individual rights, right, and a lot of settlers also did from Britain, you still had this idea that you shouldn't at least completely reject the monarchy. And that's, I think, what distinguishes liberalism in Canada and the U.S. at the very least, um, is that people believed in the fact that, you know, the small, middle, or working class person, as we'll see specifically with Mackenzie, did deserve some credit. There wasn't a complete rejection of um, of the kind of British ties, right? And so it creates a bit of a middle ground between American liberalism and British conservatism, say. That's Canada in a nutshell. We're a middle ground of Britain and America with a right. dash of France. <laughs> Just a, a little smidge of rosemary that is France or whatever. Yeah. Um, right. So in it's the vanilla extract, you know? <laughs> um, so... Yeah, uh, as we approached Confederation, right, what became the Liberal Party of Canada would incorporate basically the anti clerical sentiments from the Parti Rouge of Quebec. They would have free trade elements that came from Ontario, and they generally opposed like high public works expenditures, um, which again was kind of more of a conservative thing at the time. If you looked under the McDonald government, might we keep talking about the railroad? That was theoretically a public expenditure, right? And a lot of liberals went against it. We'll get into that a bit later, how that specifically affected the McKenzie government. But again, it's very different than what we imagine the liberals and conservatives yeah. like today. Well, now these days, conservatives don't want any government projects. Right. Or at least are more against it in some, in some regards. Yeah. 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 So it's, that's why I think this kind of setup is, in, is necessary because... Again, we need to establish ourselves in the 19th century. (laughs) Um, So broadly speaking, like you were saying, liberalism favored low tariffs, uh, which will come up, uh, broader franchise, so more people are allowed to vote, Mm -hmm. and uh, they favored like modest expenditures on defense, right? Which is very funny considering what would be created under the McKenzie government, that they would favor low defense budgets. And often, and this is where we'll kind of get back with other points later, a close relationship with the US, right? Mm-hmm. And this kind of fits in with the low tariffs uh, as well. Right? Mm-hmm. 
again, kind of funny considering that things like the North American free, tra uh, like the free trade agreements with the U.S. would also be solidified in later governments like the Mulroney governments, which were progressive conservatives, right? Um, so a bit of a historical shift there. Very similar, by the way, for American listeners to how Democrats and Republicans kind of changed over time. Mm -hmm. Republicans used to be the party of anti-slavery, right? Whereas Democrats were more of like what we imagine them with the Republicans to be today. And in the 60s, well, it was kind of a shift. Right? Well, it's also the, the very old, uh, the Confederates versus the Democratic Republicans, and then the Confederate Party stopped, and then it was the Democrats and the Republicans. This is what happens with politics. Parties change, parties fade, and parties get sliced in half. Exactly. Right. Um, so that's just a quick overview. Is there anything you wanted to add or comment on just on our brief overview of what liberalism in Canada looked like at this time? But liberalism? Yeah. Just like in our brief overview, like just at this time, I mean, is there or anything you wanted to add here? Um, well, because it would have been the opposition, right? And I cannot understate the value of having good opposition in government. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I so, know it's, I, I personally, I'm a big believer in a multi-party system, yep. but even if it's just a two party, like, yes, please, you know, at least, <laughs> yeah, right. at least, at least two parties. Yeah. At least try please make the world go round. And I think that's a really interesting point to raise because as we get into McKenzie's uh, PM McKenzie, we'll, we'll kind of see how he very much embodied what you're talking about, right? At least the idea that an alternative was different. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that's, that's an important thing to keep in mind as we're going forward and perhaps will inform how we think of him. Um, so anyway, a bit on Alexander Mackenzie, right? Not to be confused. Oh, yeah. Not to be confused with the earlier Alexander Mackenzie who crossed Canada, um, which we did a whole episode on. I think it was like one of my first episodes, episode four or something like that. Um, so this one was also Scottish. Uh, he was born in Dunkelk. Uh, because there were so many Scots people in Canada, and especially... We, we forget about it. the Scots, uh, how many Scots and Irish there, there were so, running around. There were so many. There's really, a, there's actually a really interesting book um, for listeners who might be interested in a literary approach to this that I finished reading recently called White Civility, um, The Literary Project of English Canada by Daniel Coleman. Um, and it has a whole chapter on how like the Scottish hard worker and Scottish know-how and kind of that image of a Scots, um, like a strong and hardworking Scotsman became infused in Canadian politics and in the Canadian mindset. And mm -hmm. it's really interesting. I'll try to find it and link it in the show um, if there's that specific chapter available. Ooh. So um, he came to Canada in 1842 and he intended to work as a stonemason because that's what his trade was. I think if I remember correctly, his father also was that. Okay. And people would also kind of point to this as a way of making fun of him. So we'll see with the caricatures later that we're pointing to. Mackenzie was a very straight laced guy. Right? I am. I'm pretty straight laced. <laughs> <laughs> he was a very straight-laced guy and you know a lot of people made parallels between the fact that he was a stonemason with the fact that he was just like this uptight stone-faced kind of person who took no shit mm -hmm. um and i think it's important to emphasize the stonemason aspect of this because Mackenzie was not an aristocrat right he was very much of the kind of lower middle class right um and that would again inform his politics going forward right so he did start off as uh, in the construction business and in stoneworking, although he did get injured, right? I think if I remember correctly, a stone fell on his leg and it injured him. Um, and so he kind of shifted careers toward politics and he became a newspaper editor and he was eventually elected in 1861 to the Legislative Assembly of um, what would have been Canada, uh, Canada West. Sorry, at the time. Right? And he was on a reforming platform, which had pretty similar ideas as what we were just talking about liberalism. Oftentimes, when you'll see reform in old documents, they mean basically 19th century liberals. Right? They, and in this time, he would actually obviously face, a, already from the start, pushback because of his working class background. Right. It's important to remember that politics at the time was very much an aristocrat's game. Okay, right? it's still an aristocrat's game. Yes, 
Like, let's, le- let's be honest. Like, look at who the prime minister currently is. True. Look at his last name. But at and least think about how he got into power. Of course. Like, I'm not denying that. I st- it is more acceptable today, though, to have a lower middle class person in a party than it yeah. was at the time, is all I'm saying. Yeah. Right. I know. I, st- I still genuinely feel like politics is still very much a name game yes oh yeah absolutely um and yeah you're right our current pm got in by his name <laughs> and, let's be real his actual qualifications were Zabiduda. yep anyway so getting a bit into uh alexander mckenzie's specific politics right he was a supporter of confederation right um although he was critical of what we were talking about before right of overt britishness which tended to be represented by the conservative party right Mm -hmm. we again tend to although that's something that you still see more associated with conservatives today right a big part of mcdonald's and his party's rhetoric was we're keeping the british ties we want the union jack we want to model ourselves off of a british form of government like we're basically britain in the north right that's pretty much the we're idea in north that britain for. yeah that's pretty much the idea to the uh, um that conservatives were going for mm-hmm. mackenzie was like eh Listen, I'm Scotland. <laughs> I don't want this. Right. He wasn't from the same part of Scotland as McDonald. And so he's like, nah, I don't ha- I'm not taking this shit. Um Yeah, the same for me. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, but he is quoted as saying, and I found this in one of the books I was researching, which I thought was very funny, when someone criticized him for not being British enough uh, in his early days in politics, he said, loyalty to the queen does not require a man to bow down to her manservant or her maidservant or her ass. <laughs> <laughs> I think in this case he meant donkey, but I'm not here I, to care. I, I don't care. <laughs> It's still perfect. It's still very funny. Um, So you can definitely see through something like this quote that, you know, I I just don't want to be, I just don't want to be the, like a British subject, right? Mm -hmm. It's all well and fine to inform ourselves. Uh, It's all well and fine. Sorry about that, folks. We had cat problems. Oh no! Is the kitty okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's fine. Um, He, he, he got out of his harness and he was just walking around. Yes, we keep our cat on a harness because we live in Montreal. So anyway, um, but yeah, anyway, I just think it was an interesting quote uh, to pull from in this case. Funny enough, Alexander Mackenzie would be successful enough that he was elected to both provincial legislatures and federal legislatures throughout the early days of Confederation. Right. Mm -hmm. And he would remain in that position until 1872 when the practice was actually abolished. I think that's kind of fun. It's an interesting, I I didn't think that was ever a thing that you could just sit in both houses, but apparently he was well known enough in his, um, in his writing and well respected enough that he was able to pull both federal and provincial um, support. Now, Mac, just segueing a bit into his rise as PM. Do you remember when we were talking about uh, McDonald, yeah. right? Why, like, there was a gap in his in his premiership, in his prime ministership. Do you yes. remember why? Because nobody beat him. Yes, but there was like a specific scandal that happened. Oh, I don't know. It's McDonald. What isn't there a scandal? His existence was scandalous. For real, though. <laughs> <laughs> Which so, one was this? There wasn't it, it, anything about drinking. Nobody cared about that. No, although Mac- uh, Mackenzie certainly cared about that because he was a total square. By the way, I am <laughs> like, a bit of a square. He was a very he was a complete teetotaler. He never drank in his life, and he could he could not understand why people liked this drunk buffoon that was a prime minister. <laughs> I mean, I actually like as as a Mackenzie, I've never drank. <laughs> <laughs> I really haven't, you guys. Patrick's just stating facts about me. Um, so the, what, what I'm talking about is the Pacific scandal, mm-hmm. right? Uh, so uh, McDonald was accused in 1873 of basically corruption, right? Um, of being paid off by certain prominent members of uh, a construction company to enable them to actually build the railroad across Canada, right? It's not a huge sum. If we look at it today, I think it was something like $100,000, if I remember correctly, Um, which is, you know, for inflation would be quite a substantial amount. But, you know, 
I'm sure there are worst cases of fraud in politics. Um, but it would bring about uh, a lack of trust in the conservative government. And so early in 1873, uh, shortly, after, um, shortly after Alexander Mackenzie became head of the Liberal Party, he was asked by the governor general, Lord Dufferin, to be the head of state mm -hmm. because, you know, uh, we had to kind of sweep McDonald under the rug for a bit because of the, the scandal. We needed somebody else. <laughs> we needed the total opposite. Right. And we didn't want any, like, he was still, McDonald was still leader of the Conservative Party, so we couldn't just take another person from the Conservatives because mm -hmm. the Conservatives still liked McDonald in many ways. And so, because he was charismatic and intelligent, and so they didn't want to uh, oust him from the party. And so Dufferin just looked across the room and was like, well, Mackenzie, I guess you're up. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and he would sit out for the rest of 1873 until there was an election. Um, so at first, it's kind of interesting because it's kind of an accident of history that Alexander Mackenzie ended up as prime minister in more ways than one. A, because of the corruption scandal, but also because he wasn't exactly the first candidate for the, being the head of the Liberal Party. George Brown, uh, who we've talked about before and is one of the fathers of Confederation, was certainly a party favorite, but he just didn't feel like like joining up with the party again for a bit. Um, and he hadn't been reelected to his seat. So, you know, it was just not something that he was capable of doing. And Edward Blake also uh, was another favorite, and he just didn't care enough uh, to <laughs> actually, he was like, nah, I don't no, think I will. I'm good, I'm fine. Although, funny enough, Edward Blake would be a thorn in Alexander Mackenzie's side later in his tenure. Of course. That's how it goes. I didn't want it, but now I do. Yeah, that's literally exactly what would happen. Um, and yeah, even Lord Dufferin, who kind of felt obliged to, uh, to name Alexander Mackenzie as interim PM, didn't much like Alexander Mackenzie, he thought he was kind of too stuck up and that he wouldn't actually make any kind of interesting decisions for Canada, but he actually felt um, that he got to know basically Mackenzie and mm -hmm. would learn to appreciate him. Aww, honestly. He still felt, however, it is important to note that like many people, and which does explain the British favoring of the Conservative Party, Lord Dufferin, like many, did feel that the Conservatives were the quote-unquote natural party of Canada. Right. right. Because they still had those British associations. And so it would have been an easier transition. He's, he's a lord. Of course he's going to want the one that's not anti-aristocrat. -arist exactly. Like, exactly. I don't, I don't take that much as like, a strong candidacy quality. <laughs> so just to sum up uh, this part here, um, did you look at the poem that I linked to? In um... I did look at it. I hate it, but I looked at it. So what does verse three uh, read? Because I put out a po uh, I, I pulled out a poem from a poet that we've read before, Alexander McLaughlin, yeah. um, and. I think that this verse in particular very much represents what Alexander Mackenzie kind of points towards. Our aristocracy of toil have made us what you see. The nobles of the forge and soil with near a pedigree. It makes one feel himself a man. His very blood leaps faster. Where wit or worse prefer to birth and jacks as good as his master. Right. So Jack That's in this one, case, right? yeah, Jack in this case is Canada, by the way, is mm -hmm. a, um, a metaphor. Yeah, it's a metaphor, but um, it's symbolic. Right. But I think that this is very, that this very much represents Mackenzie in many ways mm -hmm. or Alexander Mackenzie, right? You know, the, the a hardworking person will make it to the top. It's not just birth, which is kind and, of a myth. And, but, and okay. it's, it's not wrong, though. It's not a wrong idea to have. Yeah, that, you know, people can do it their own. I don't know. Yeah, especially in this day and age, like like you were saying, there's still a lot of you know aristocracy in the government, but especially in this day and age when he's actively fighting for uh, mm -hmm. a, against what is systematically an aristocrat's game. I think it's a really interesting. Um, I think it's a really interesting perspective to have, right? Um, sure. So, if we look into the more uh, PM <laughs> section, right? Did you actually have a time to look a bit at the caricatures? Um, very briefly, I opened the tabs. I haven't really read anything about them, though. Okay. There's not much to read about them. Like, Walk uh, me through it. 
So if we look under the first, uh, the first one um, in like underneath the, the first point in PM. Okay. This right. is the one, the guy sitting on the Pacific scandal pit. Right. Pi. Pi. Yeah. So in this case, what, uh, do you know what you're looking at in this case? No, not at all. Okay. So the, uh, again, these will be linked, but the person on the right with the beard mm -hmm. is Alexander McKenzie. Okay. Right. So that's who he is. Um, and the person on the left is supposed to be Edward Blake, right? He's still a bit of a liberal um, powerhouse, right? Mm -hmm. Even though he wasn't super involved in the party itself uh, officially. And at the top is Dufferin, right? Uh, the, the, uh, or the, the Lord, or the Governor General, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in the pie, basically, are everyone who is involved in the Pacific scandal. So you'll see McDonald's, you'll see Hugh Allen, there's even Uncle Sam in there because the Americans were involved. Um, and so this is basically, to me at least, what, um, or at least this is how Mackenzie ran as a platform in 1873-74, right? Mm -hmm. When he was officially up for election, right? He was like, look, these people are corrupt, right? And look, we can make something out of this. We can actually like make something good out of this terrible situation. And the Liberal Party is there to solve it, right? Um, so I just wanted to kind of uh, do that one just to, to kind of set the scene at the very least, right? Plus, I kind of like the idea of depicting Mackenzie as a hard worker, right? He's a baker, he's lower class type of thing. Um, <laughs> facing up against the uh the lord right um literally making mincemeat or like a pie out of the conservatives and um if you want to look at the second link right underneath it yeah this is the one it's the the judge stand yes what do you see there um okay so are these all the same guy yeah who's that i don't know oh it's sir johnny mcdonald yep oh because he's judge jerry executioner Exactly. Nice. <laughs> so, again, one of the things that during the campaign Mackenzie would criticize mm -hmm. about McDonald is that in the so-called Royal Commission to look into the corruption scandal, basically McDonald had put in all his friends. And mm -hmm. so he was just like, well, this is fucking bullshit. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, why, why, why is this even a thing? Because we all know it's just going to end up with you being absolved. Like if all your, <laughs> if all your, um, if all your friends are, are the ones doing it. So again, just very much a demonstration of where Mackenzie stood in this case. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, let's see. Sorry. Um, so in the elections that were set to, um, bring in the new prime minister in 1874, right. If we look at uh, the third caricature, right? Um, the this one shows both of them side by side. So it's um, I don't know if you found that one, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Oh, this is the third one. Yeah. Ah, uh, yes. This is the legal, the liberal program. Uh, is it? Or is this, or is this, no, no. Sorry. This is the okay it's sideways. Yeah. Oh God! What is that? So what is this? It's basically on the on the uh, right. You have McDonald again. Mm -hmm. in armor and on the left you have uh, you have mckenzie mcdonald versus mckenzie right and they're basically it's a basically a caricature of the um of the actual election right and mckenzie is quoted as saying uh from this is from hamlet by the way i will hamlet. fight him i will fight him upon this theme until my eyelids will no longer wag right very much again just firmly believing in his own uh, in his own uh, power, right? Because, you know, he has the moral high ground. And the only thing that MacDonald in armor has to say is something from Richard III. What do I fear? I'm fucking John A. MacDonald. I don't care. <laughs> I don't give a shit. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting. So in this whole election, both men just thought they were bulletproof, right? Despite oh the scandal. <laughs> My God. Oh, because it's, uh, I'm Johnny fucking <laughs> Like he didn't obviously say that, but the, that's what he was thinking. Oh, for sure. There's no doubt in my mind that that's exactly what he's thinking. Because McDonald was like, I I brought this country into existence, right? I've seen worse, right? <laughs> There's no way I'm gonna lose this election to no. this low-born 
like stuck up person right whereas Mackenzie was taking up like very much the opposite stance of saying well I have the moral high ground here I wasn't corrupt I'm not drunk right and I can actually bring some kind of stability to the government right um so kind of a very funny representation uh in this ultimately the uh the liberals would win right with a majority Right. Although McDonald would actually win his seat in Kingston. <laughs> Surprisingly enough, like the people of Kingston just did not care. <laughs> Apparently, no, still won. they don't give a shit. <laughs> he nevertheless won back his seat, so he could sit in the House of Commons and he was part of the debates going forward. So, despite being a kind of, um, a kind of shown as corrupt and drunk, he was still there and he would like remain in the background of any kind of debates for the entirety of Mackenzie's five-year period as, um, as the government. And as you were pointing out earlier, right, with the other uh, caricature, the liberal program, right? Liberal program. You basically see a bunch of liberal members, including Alexander Mackenzie himself dressed as a woman scrubbing the floors. Um, in they're basically they're, saying, these, these cartoons are wild. I just oh, they're great. Exactly. They're all by John Wilson Bengo, by the way, who's the same guy who did most of the caricatures that we talked about last time with mm -hmm. Mackenzie. They're not as great, by the way, I feel, as the ones aimed at McDonald because Bengal was a liberal and so he had more ammo to go at with McDonald. And also because the liberals were kind of milk toast, and as we'll see, kind of struggling throughout their entire. Uh, their entire tenure. So there were there was a bit less to go off of, but there's still some pretty funny stuff here. So yeah, basically the liberal program is them cleaning the filth and purifying everything um, from uh, the conservative uh, Pacific <laughs> scandal, right? Okay. We'll see if that actually works. <laughs> <laughs> any, uh, any thoughts or additional comments so far? What do you make of Mackenzie and his government just initially? Oh boy. Um, it seems he seems like he has good intentions, mm -hmm. good ideas for Canada. And then again, a second party is never a bad thing. That's true. You know, and it's I, I, I do think. How do I say this? I don't know because he's the right kind of guy for the right time. You know, like yeah. McDonald was the guy that was needed to make the country, mm -hmm. but Mackenzie looks like the kind of guy that can like settle the country, as in like give it a foundation that's strong enough to work on. Right. Or at least, yeah, we'll like see. The, the conservative fiscally part, you know, the, the part yeah. that's going to keep us from spiraling out of control. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, in many ways, he would fail with that. <laughs> yes, unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but it's interesting. So if we actually, you're bringing out like fiscally conservative part. So in terms of the economy, right? Mackenzie was both personally and in his public life, like hardworking, a penny pinching Scott, right? In many ways. Um, and he was actually often criticized by people for almost serving as his own finance minister, right? But there is something that's kind of related to this in an interesting way. And that's in a sense, this active refusal of the patronage system, which was a common practice at the time. Do you know what the patronage system is? Um, no. Or do you know I what? saw it, but I don't know. I know what patrons are in general, like from an artistic perspective. So I have to imagine it's similar to that setup. Yeah, it's exactly that, except with government officials. Mm -hmm. So that can obviously lead to some problems. As we can see, right, it can, uh, a lot of the McDonald uh, defenders argued that something like the Pacific scandal is more akin to patronage, right? Mm -hmm. And it was kind of hard to argue for corruption, right? Because it happened quite often, both, I think this is common practice in Britain as well and in the States where it's like, yeah, I'm just supporting a local candidate and then mm -hmm. I might get a house or I might get a something uh, like a role to play in the government, but I have the money and mm -hmm. I want to support my candidate. Right? There you go. Um, and so the line between corruption and patronage was kind of blurred in many ways um, and wouldn't be actually systematized, I think, until the 70s in Canada, by the way. Like it was a relatively common practice until quite recently in the grand scheme of things. Um, but of course, our hero, Alexander Mackenzie, had no patience for that kind of shenanigans. No right? patience. Because it went against his morals, right? 
And he had such disdain for it that it literally led him to create a secret staircase in Parliament <laughs> so that he could avoid people who would seek to buy him, right? Or to propose, um, to propose any kind of patronage. And by the way, that staircase was re remained a secret for over a century, mm -hmm. right? Like Pierre Trudeau would use it, Mulroney would use it. And that's in the 80s. And it's just a way for people to avoid journalists and patrons and anything like that, mm -hmm. which I think is kind of funny. Um, and again, kind of represents the kind of do-it-yourself attitude that um, Alexander Mackenzie represented. Right? So in terms of like going off of the economy as well, right? there's the free trade aspect that liberalism represented at the time. Free trade. So if you'll recall, we had that McDonald was kind of developing, though it wouldn't be put into place just yet. He was developing what he called the national policy. Do you remember what that was? Oh God, it was, the national policy was the idea. It was, there was the railroad to so connecting Canada from coast to coast, uh, creating a country that could stand on its own, didn't need dependency on trade. Mm -hmm. um, well, there was a third point, wasn't there? It was basically um, nationalism in the form of economy. Yeah. Right. So like you're saying, developing railroads, um, it, it, it increased British attachment and internal, internal economies. So tariffs, right? Mm -hmm. Placing a bunch of tariffs with the US. Um, and part of this is part of the reason why the national policy was actively implemented or tried to be implemented after is in response to many of the effects of the Alexander Mackenzie government, which right. tended to open up borders, right? Uh, so for example, one of the first things that they did was to re renegotiate the, Wash the Treaty of Washington, which had been originally signed in 1871 and established relatively good relationships bet relations between the US and Canada. The, uh, the Mackenzie government went over and were like, we renegotiated a bit and basically made for the idea that there would be less duties between the two countries, <laughs> right? <laughs> I was fearing the joke, but I still laughed. <laughs> <laughs> well, me, not smart as to the shed. But the 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 idea here is that it was supposed to reinforce Canada's economy, right? Mm -hmm. That's the idea of. Well, and you'll hear that to this day. It's like, well, free trade reinforces economy, right? That was the idea behind the one in the eighties. It's still the idea today, right? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately for Mackenzie. He kind of struck this deal at the same time as one of the worst economic depressions hit literally most of the Western world in the 19th century. <laughs> Listen, I didn't mean to do it. It's just what it <laughs> happened. Okay, yeah, explain yourself. Like, what explain. was your thought process behind this? About the Pacific scandal? No, no, no. The, the depression and, like, the, the, the Treaty of Washington renegotiations. If, if it uh, wasn't your intention, what was your intention in this case? My intention was to create a more just society where a man could stand on his own. Yep. And unfortunately, I failed to realize that sometimes it, oversight is needed. Sometimes when, when things get tough, you know, you gotta, you gotta sit back and let the government do its job. This sometimes. As a whole. Sometimes the free market doesn't do everything. No, sometimes the free market fails. So it's kind of funny, funny because, enough. funny enough, yeah, it happens. Um, there obviously are arguments to be made, like some liberals argued, well, it's because of the actions of the conservative party and whatever, that now we're in this slump and we have to get out of it. But ultimately it was out of most people's hands. There were periods of huge agricultural problems everywhere across the world in Western Canada as well. Like, and it just created more and more divisions, um, both within the country and in international trade. Mm -hmm. right? There's this really funny section in a book I quoted from before, George Bowering's Egotists and Autocrats, which kind of represents, I think, what I'm talking about here and the aftermath of this attempt at opening up the free trade oh boy. in Canada. Um, so in this case, the man, Mackenzie, who had built his business stone by stone, became the victim of the worst international depression of the 19th century. I was. And so, and so it was characterized at the time. Um, he needed help, but here he was, the loyal party man who had always done everything he could for Brown and Blake, left to run things pretty much on his own. Blake quit as soon as the election was won, only to come back later as a rival. Brown would not sit in the Commons, so Mackenzie tried to make him a senator, and other friends coughed into his hands and backed away. <laughs> 
Right. Only oh, Dorian, who's from Quebec, came to help and took over the justice mystery. Uh, but then he would resign to become the number one lawyer in Quebec. Mackenzie himself took over the Ministry of Public Works. What else could he do? Mm -hmm. Literally, he's left to his own devices at this point, to the point where he has to kind of double team certain things in the government. And respect to the man for that, honestly. That he was able to pull it off? Cool. Yeah. But also, damn, what a nightmare. <laughs> Especially, you just started off. Like, you're, you're running on a campaign of, like, we're, we're going to fix this. Everything is going to be great. And, oh, no, things are failing everywhere. Like, it literally could not be worse. <laughs> like, there are no funds. Anyway, moving on to our next uh, caricature. Uh, so the next link after, uh, so this really, uh, so in the CPR, sorry, Canadian Pacific Railway. Um, oh, it's not the best image, but you'll be able to see this one. What's here? What do you see? What is this? So this is... The grip cartoon? Yeah, they're all grip cartoons, but okay. it's um, underneath the point, this related to his ability to complete the CPR on time. Okay. Um... Page 149. Yeah. Or 150, yeah. rather. Oh, okay. It's the, it's the woman standing in the... And yeah, the what, guy at the desk. Okay, so yeah. What... We keep going. Uh, so the woman is Britannia, or oh, Canada, God. rather. There's the United States map on the wall. Mm-hmm. Uh, the guy at the desk, by the way, is Alexander McKenzie. Ah. Uh, there's a bunch of people crowding in, in the front area. Yeah. So it looks like a school, basically. Um, there's a bunch of small people um, with at the head of it Mackenzie. Who's Canada holding? I don't know. Is that McDonald? Yes. Of course it is. <laughs> with a bit of a sly grin on his face. And what's... I, I get to look up her skirt now. <laughs> <laughs> and what does, um, what, does, what does the text underneath say? Oh god, let me see. Pity the Domini or Johnny's Return. <laughs> and <laughs> and Canada's saying, like, here's our Johnny for you again, Mr. McKenzie. You'll find him apt enough, but frankly, sir, he's full of mischief. And what you were describing on the wall, right, the map is interesting because you see the map of Canada in the U.S., or at least the border, and the railroad, mm -hmm. right? And how would you describe the railroad in this case? It's just all over the place. Yeah. It's literally it's nonsense. It's it's a it's a scribble that the artist did at the last second. And here's the thing, like they that's the that's the like that was why you needed a guy like Mackenzie. Because the railroad was a bit of a mess and John and McDonald kinda of didn't know what the fuck he was doing. He was too drunk to function. <laughs> so you have a guy like Mackenzie who puts his head down, he's very straight lipped, but he puts his head down, he gets to work and he's mm -hmm. like, Okay, we need to do this, this, this and this. We promised to work I don't want a railroad. I don't want a public project, but you know what? We made the promise. God damn it. We're going to see it through. Right. So it's kind of, it's interesting. So again, his honesty kind of takes, his famous honesty kind of takes the, mm -hmm. to, takes the cake in this one. But, you know, he also ran into a problem because people were simultaneously asking for the railroad to go a bit more up north and some were asking for it to go to the south and some were asking he obviously needed to at least get it to british columbia because that was part of their deal to enter into confederation and that was going nowhere fast mm -hmm. uh, by this point and so it was just a monster headache and then there's the depression that happens and then he's working on his own he's the only person in the office <laughs> So he's alone. Cash well, let's be real. If if this was the McDonald administration, it would have all fallen apart. Yeah. Like let's like McDonald would not have done that. McDonald would not have ducked his head and got gotten to work. Right. Um like maybe we wouldn't be in the same mess, but we'd still be in a mess, I'm sure, because the fucking railroad was a mess anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And we survived because we had this guy who was just an honest dude and he was like, you know what? I'm gonna do it myself then. Right. <laughs> Um, it would kind over of... the backs of thousands of slave laborers and the Chinese migrants that we pay no wages to. Or very little. Very little. Um, but yeah, there was also the added incentive, if you will, that a lot of the Americans that Mackenzie had just entered into a, more or less of a free trade kind of agreement into mm -hmm. wanted to move up north, right? They wanted to expand the U.S. northward right? A uh, bit of an annexation mode right there going on, obviously, in the States and in Canada. And the U.S. were like, hey, 
there's no structure between Ontario or Manitoba and BC. So that means it's free real estate. Let's free maybe real estate, move, baby. Let's maybe move into it, right? Um, they never actually did, obviously, except in Alaska. Yeah. But like the idea is like, okay, well, this is also an incentive to build the railroad because apparently in the Western European mind, if there's if there's something built on it, that means you own it. If not, it's free. It's free property. Which, you know, leads to a series of problems, but that's the idea. But we won't talk about that. But uh, that's for another, another day. Episode. Um, however, because of the lack of funds and all, um, Mackenzie, as honest as ever, was kind of forced to admit that they kind of had to maybe put the project on hold, right? And because they simply couldn't pay anyone to do it, right? And they, they again, turning to Bowering, there was an interesting... Uh, there's an interesting point here. Um, where is it? Uh, oh, damn. I where I is it? it? Oh, I thought I had it here, but... Oh, I... Oh, yeah, here we go. Sorry, I put the wrong page number down. <laughs> um, okay, so here we go. Mackenzie looked around. The depression was becoming more visible all the time. The farmers had no one to sell produce to, and they could not afford to buy seed. There were unemployment. Uh, there were unemployed men living in crates in Toronto. You could see the floor between coins in the treasury. You, what should I tell the population? Mackenzie asked himself. There was mm -hmm. no argument for the Baptist idealist. He told the populace that Canada was just about broke. This was before governments hired econ economists who could fiddle statistics and deficit financing. So he was just kind of forced to admit it. And the Minister of Public Works told his fellow citizens there was no money to build a grand steel road to the Pacific. John A. MacDonald sat in his parliamentary chair and started to grin under his long nose. <laughs> this kind of is something that Bowering deals with, and I think he's very right in this sense. Mackenzie's honesty, while good in many ways, was also kind of his undoing, mm -hmm. right? Because something that we talked about <clears throat> with McDonald, right, is that he kind of understood the power of myth, right? He understood that sometimes people don't want to hear the truth or that they don't need to know the whole truth, right? And that made him very popular for a long time, right? And so that was part of the um, part of at least some people's uh, analysis, right? Uh, that they say, um, you know, Mackenzie was just too honest. <laughs> oh, yeah, and that can be a problem. Sometimes. Like that, the, the sad truth is that will cost you an election. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, no matter how morally superior you are. <laughs> you, the that, honesty and truth will cost you in the end. Exactly. Horrible. What a terrible thing to, to have to okay. do. Um, so ultimately, this would actually cause a lot of issues. We might actually talk about this when we talk about the, when we do a full episode on the railroad. But like it caused a great deal of um, in, uh, dissatisfaction in British Columbia, which by this point had officially become part of Canada, but mm -hmm. only on the condition that the railroad would be built that connected like yeah. Canada to Western Canada. What they wanted, what, what they were promised. Right. And so they were like, well, this is nonsense. And you could start to hear the whispers in British Columbia of like, how about we separate from Canada? Oh, yeah, God. this might be a good thing. Um, maybe the Americans want something to do with this as well, right? And so the massive headache that Mackenzie was dealing with just like exacerbated, like exploded even more because it was like, God damn it, now I have to deal with secession in this new freaking country. Um, and I'm skipping a lot of points here, but there were like actual protests and people out in the streets in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, the only thing that kind of saved the Mackenzie government from like revolution in British Columbia was that the colonial secretary at the time, Lord Carnivan, agreed to say, well, look, you'll get your, you'll get your railroad, but at least give the Canadian government until 1890. Mm -hmm. Right. We need a bit more time. We just need a bit more time. We'll hold them to it. But it's just like, as you can see, everyone's kind of strapped for cash right now. Right. There's just nothing we can do about it. If they're not done by 1890, then we'll, we'll, we'll have another discussion about this. Anything you wanted to add about this in particular? Um, about the railroad? Yeah. No, I think it's, it's, 
how do I say yeah, yeah, like this is again where we see the parts of McDonald that aren't so good. Honestly, mm-hmm. this is a really good spot. Yeah. McDonald jumping on this opportunity instead of trying to reach out and help a hand with the country that he apparently loves. You know, founded a country and all that, but he's not willing to try and like yeah. so he's make just sure that there. country gets the best help it can, you know? Mm-hmm. And still he's still like, No, no, I need to win more than I need to help Canada. That's the thing. He like love him or hate him, he was a good politician. Oh yeah. He knew like he knew that he was in hot water at that moment, so he bided his time. Mm-hmm. Right? Said, "Okay, well, they're putting themselves in hot water. They're just sinking themselves deeper. All right. That's fine. I can wait. I can wait 5 years. It's not the end of the world in the grand scheme of things." So, yeah, you're right. It's not a great moment. No. So, we've kind of touched upon like some of the more negative aspects of the Liberal Party's tenure so far, right? But I do want to mention some good things, or at least uh, some more positive aspects. You can agree or disagree with them, although some of them I think are pretty universally agreed upon as being good. Mm -hmm. Um, So for example, the government would reform electoral law, right? Um, Because of Mackenzie's vision that Canada would be more democratic than it actually is currently. um, And he actually envisioned a future in which Canada would be more democratic than Britain right? He had no patience for the aristocracy, as you were saying. So he was like, you know what? Mm-hmm. We're going to bring in a new elections act, which is called the Dominion Elections Act, which came out in May 1874. So early in their tenure. And it introduced secret ballots in Canada, right? So uh, because before, do you know how people elected or voted? How did the people, how did they do it? Tell me. So people voted basically out loud, right? And this was true in the States as well, which is why the necessity of anonymous, anonymous ballots seems so like so weird perhaps now. But at the time, it was kind of necessary because you literally showed up at the ballot box and yelled out your candidate. <laughs> and then someone who was able to write, wrote it down and put it in a box, right? And that's how it happened. But that, can, that obviously led to a great deal of issues. Um, namely corruption, because then you could say, okay, well, I'm going to pay you to vote for this person and I can prove it because I can listen to you say that you're voting for that person right Mm -hmm. after. And that was one of the reasons why the McKenzie government was kind of backing off against it. It was like, that's kind of bullshit. Um, (laughs) so there, there, there were some arguments, some people arguing against it, namely from the conservative party who were like, well, you know, one should be proud of your vote. Um, or, you know, we want to be able to pay off, uh, like to see that our investment paid off in buying some votes, but whatever, well, we're not going to mention that one. Um, but do we still have that? Yes. Uh, What do you mean? The, uh, the secret ballot? Yeah. Yeah, of course. You don't have to tell anyone you're. Okay. Good. Good, good, good. Have you never voted? No, I voted. I just couldn't remember. I just couldn't remember. So I, was like, <laughs> I can't remember if people can track like who and what are, where what our votes are or anything. I know? don't. I don't see how it would be possible because you go up. Right. Think of the process. Right. You go up to the person. Yeah. Just no, to I, just, I just yourself. don't trust the government. You know. Fair enough. That's our main takeaway today. No matter how good they are, don't trust the government. Yeah. Why would I? They've never given me a reason. Right. So. This was part of a whole anti-corruption program that the liberal government was going through. And that also included straight up actually putting people on trial or at least having them get penalties or like specifically MPs getting penalties if they were found of corrupting the vote. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately for Mackenzie, who was so straight-laced and like on his moral high horse, he found that a great deal of his own party members would also be accused of corruption. <laughs> and so that kind of just like ended up slapping him in the face <laughs> a bit. Yeah. And, and you can see that in the caricature that I put under anti-corruption here. Um, but again, he, he did it. He, yeah. Like he, he, he probably knew what was going to happen and he did it anyway. Maybe. If, yeah. if nothing else, he had his morals. That's true. So, did he you had his, to... He had his belief that uh, yeah. we shouldn't have... Which one is this? So the one under the anti-corruption point. Okay, cool. Because I opened all of them. So I'm oh, trying okay. to search through uh, them. Yeah, that one. Um, Let's see what this one is again. So you'll see like two... Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So two yeah. young boys. A couple of strapping young men. Yeah, it's two versions again of McDonald and McKenzie. In this case, holding hands. Right. Um, and underneath, Mackenzie is saying, 
come along, John, and put down, uh, put down bribery and corruption. Neither of us can ride one mule yet a while. Uh, yon mule yet a while. So kind of pointing to the fact of, like, the mule in the back says electoral law reform. Oh. And they're saying, like, oh, you know, oops. I guess, uh, I guess we're <laughs> both in the same boat now. Yeah. But at least Mackenzie himself was never accused of corruption. corruption which I no. guess, like... If nothing else. Small wins. <laughs> Hit last few, for small victories. Yeah. Last point, that, uh, or last few points that I want to make, right? Um, the Supreme Court of Canada was actually made under Mackenzie as well. This was, a, this was a bill that was originally attempted to be created under the Conservatives, right? And while there was some kind of pushback from the Conservatives saying like, oh, you're kind of stealing our bill here. Like, that's a bit of a dick move politically. Mm-hmm. Um Ultimately, there wasn't that much of a fight put up because we were like, well, it gets us to the same point anyway. However, where there would be pushback is that suddenly, at the last minute, someone proposed that the Supreme Court of Canada would be the final court of appeal, like the highest court of appeal in the land, Mm -hmm. as opposed to the British court. And that got conservatives pissed off. I'm sure. How dare we not answer to the people that don't even live here? Exactly. There... I've seen some historians who mentioned that there were some clauses in it that said that sometimes you could appeal to the British courts, but Mm -hmm. the actual reasons for that are a bit nebulous, right? Um, So it it never really happened much. Um, And again, like, this is just so crazy to me. Like, the conservatives, I'm so happy that we found a second party so early on. (laughs) But like again, and that there was somebody who could stand up to McDonald, right, and win. You know, the 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 argument behind it, or at least for the conservatives, was like, well, this is fine and all. It's great that we have our own laws. But what's the next step? Are we going to take down the Union Jack and have our own flag? What the hell kind of nonsense is that? Funny enough, the liberals would also do that. But hey, that's (laughs) they'd be like, hey, look at this cool leaf. Let's make a flag for it. Although that was, funny enough, that was something that was starting to be a debate at the time already of the flag. Oh my god. And, well, it was starting. It would more actively be in the later part of the 19th century, but what you saw were liberals starting to adopt more and more the Red Ensign, which is Canada's kind of unofficial flag for a long time and looks very much, for people who don't know, like the, uh, like the Ontario flag, right? Um, but the, Brit- uh, the conservatives were like, this is preposterous. Like the Union Jack should be it. And it became like a back and forth basically of like whether or not Canada should have an official flag. And it became a debate up until the 60s when we just stopped. Um, as you're, as I said at the beginning of the episode, conservatives would also want to pass a bill uh, that was eventually passed by the liberals on the creation of the Northwest Mounted Police, which we'll mm-hmm. get to in a few episodes. There's a whole thing surrounding it, including one of like what's known as the Cypress Hills massacres and stuff like that. And like we'll get into why that was created at that moment, because I think it's really interesting and we'll get back to actually some literature finally on, uh, on that idea. Yay! Um, but what's kind of interesting as well is again, kind of pointing to the more conservative elements of the Liberal Party, it's under the Liberal Party at the time that the Canada Temperance Act would be created, right? And so the, it basically gave local governments the option for them locally to ban the sale of alcohol because there was this kind of uh, moral panic uh, around uh, around alcohol and whiskey specifically in Canada, right? And Mackenzie, being the dour, straight-faced Baptist that he was, was always supported uh, by the temperance movements that were rising up at the time, right? And so they just passed it as an act. But I think it, I, the reason why I'm kind of focusing on this one in particular, which I think is interesting, is that it gives local governments the option, right. which, unlike the conservative government, would be much more centralized. Whereas the liberals are like, no, we'll give provinces the individual ability to do that. It's a much give more the decentralized province power. Yeah. It's a much more decentralized view of Canada, right? And so already you see this kind of divide that's happening between decentralized and centralized. How does that function in Canada? And it's still a debate that goes on to this very day, obviously. Mm-hmm. But you start to see the seeds of it already here and probably before Confederation. <laughs> um However, 
the liberals would start to fracture under the pressure of all these various things that they kind of have to juggle with, especially the railroad. And this is where Edward Blake that we mentioned before kind of would return to the party and be like, hey, I see you're having trouble with all of this. So why don't you let me uh, pop on by? Would you, yeah, I'm just offering, just like, just putting it out there. Do what you will. I know you're, you're doing a great job, but like I see it's, it's hard for you. You look a bit pale and old. Mackenzie was getting sick at the time. Mm-hmm. Would you, what would you say if I became, like, if I took over for a bit? Like, just, just, just for a bit, what would you say? Like, seems, seems like a fair deal. You'd be able to rest. You know, I'd be getting back my foot into politics. Um, but ultimately, that went nowhere. But it's, like, that's the kind of divisions that we're starting to see at this, at this point. Mm-hmm. Right? People not trusting each other. Um, the, not, the, the, the incapacity for the liberal government to actually get people out of this recession, things kind of fall apart. Whoopsies. Yeah. And this is where we'll kind of get back to the origins of the Liberal Party a bit, because as the next elections came up in 1878, the Liberals realized that they started having less and less support in Quebec right? The soon-to-be famous Wilfrid Laurier, uh, who would eventually obviously become Prime Minister of Canada, mm-hmm. uh, was not yet the like massive superstar politician that he would become. He was, he was considered a bit too young to have the chops. He's just not ready. Right. Even though he... Phrase from the Trudeau campaign. Right. And like, that's kind of what it is. He was brilliant, apparently, and he did, he was literally at this point, Mackenzie's right-hand man. But he wasn't old enough yet, so he's just not ready. <laughs> um, even though he would probably have, he might have saved this campaign. I don't know. That's a big historical if, but you know, he wasn't quite there yet. And he would have basically helped with the Quebec campaign. Um, but in an attempt to kind of garner support in French Canada, Mackenzie, to kind of relate this back to another episode that we did, would arrange for an amnesty of the Manitoban rebels, right? Mm-hmm. Who had been exiled after the first, um, first rebellion, the Riel Rebellion in 1870, right? And he even promised amnesty for Riel if he stayed quiet for five years. Don't stir the pot for like the next five years and I'll promise you amnesty. Probably for the time of like, just don't do anything during my, my tenure and you'll be fine, basically, is what he's saying. Um, despite this, Riel would actually be re-elected to the House of Commons, by the way, which is a little oh. fact. Um, he never sat in the House because he knew what was good for him. But during this period, um, he, would, uh, he would officially be an MP, <laughs> funny enough. Um, much to the dismay of both liberals and conservatives in a rare moment of unity between the two parties. But one of the reasons why the liberals couldn't, uh, couldn't get a foothold in Quebec was because of the anti-clericalism that they represented, right? Mm-hmm. And the conservatives impl- exploited that, right? They were saying, hey, there's a conservative bishop in Quebec, Monseigneur Bourget, which we've talked about on our episode um, on censorship in Canada, in Victorian Canada. And, uh, you know, he might be interested in supporting the Conservative Party because we're not anti-clerical and he has a lot of influence in Quebec. So, hey, let's, uh, you know, while the liberals are dealing with British Columbia and all that, let's get chummy chummy with uh, uh, Monseigneur Bourget here. And Mm -hmm. indeed, it kind of worked. (laughs) Right. Um, So, when the election was ca- called in 1878, Mackenzie thought he had a fair shot, but ultimately he lost Quebec. And despite the kind of alleviating depression, it didn't help. And you know what? That just That's still an honest fact today. If you don't have Quebec, you cannot win an election. Like, it's very hard. <laughs> like, or at least you're... It's, 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 you can't do it. You literally can't do it. It's very... Yeah, it's, you, it's, need, it's, you need, you need those literally wild French Canadians. Yeah. You need yeah. those wild French Canadians out there. Absolutely, right? Um, so this is at the moment where Macdonald not only got close to the more conservative element of Quebec, which helped him, right? But also by this point, he kind of exploited the, uh, the receding depression. It was like, see, okay, so it's going well now. How about national policy? So tariffs and all, you saw with the hell that we went through with the liberal government. It was their fault that it was a depression. Anyway, national policy. And I'm charismatic and I'm Johnny McDonald. I'm still young-ish at this point, right? I'm middle-aged. I can take us into the future. 
Into and the future. like we were saying, like Mackenzie kind of lost having never understood the power of myth making that McDonald grasped so well. That's true. If you can't, people love a story more yeah. than anything else. Yeah. And he told them, like McDonald told people what they wanted to hear. Yeah. Right. That's pretty much what got him in. And he never lost an election until he died. Right. So. Funny enough, Mackenzie would stay on as um, as head of the liberal Liberal Party for a bit, although he would um, he would like remove himself from that uh, from that position. He would maintain his ties to the Liberal Party until his retirement from politics in 1880 because of mm-hmm. ill health. He would expand himself into life insurance after, and he actually became the first president of the North American Life Insurance Company. Um, so that's kind of cool. And to his dying day, he kept refusing knighthood, right? Um, which is, which for a long time was conferred to prime ministers in Canada, right? That's why most of them are named Sir X, right? Because it was an honor to serve the British empire. And until he died, he refused all of them. He was offered, I think three times and he never took it Mm -hmm. because of his, uh, of his sentiments, right? And so I want to look at one final caricature here that you'll find in the conclusion section of the notes. And I think this kind of sums up Mackenzie's tenure a bit, um, how people saw him, what he represented. What do you see? Uh, This is the one where you see him, um, so in the one in conclusion. Oh, is this the one with the statue? Yes. Britannia's there. Yep. So that's Mackenzie. That's me. Yes. (laughs) Molded from marble. Yes. It's my birth. Exactly. So mm-hmm. what's written on the stone? Oh God, I can't even see that. Um, oh, okay, you can zoom in. 30 sure. independent, independence parliament. Yeah, electoral, uh, electoral, electoral purity. purity and independence parliament. Uh, okay. Right. And you see this kind of Canada who looks a bit weary, right? She, she, she's not doing 100% great, but you know, Mackenzie looks strong and capable. And it's written underneath the premier's model or implements to those who can use them. And Canada's saying, well, and bravely done, Mackenzie. Now stand by your policies and I'm always with you. Oh. Like, no, unfortunately, Canada would not vote for him again. Um, but to me, to me, it kind of represents... You can't just be a hard worker to be the leader. Yeah. Being absolutely. a hard worker gets you the chief of staff job. <laughs> but uh, to me, it kind of represents like he's standing tall in this caricature. Like... He came at a moment when Canada looked beaten down a bit because of the Pacific scandal and because of depression. Mm-hmm. And he tried to actively change things. Yeah, and again, like, credit, like, the, he was the man we needed at the time, most likely, to get us out of the slump, to, what was it, make us a country. You know, everything we've sort of presented to you today, yeah, he was a bit of a stick in the mud. Yeah, he didn't really get some things. Mm-hmm. And he didn't understand how certain things were done. Yeah. But he, we needed him. That's true. We I, needed I, a guy like him. I can, I can see that. Yeah. Johnny McDonald's the guy we want to hang out with. He's the cool, fun guy. He's the but Steve wait, of the gang. Yeah, but you can't always rely on Steve. No, exactly. So, with that in mind, in like our ongoing list of prime ministers, where would mm-hmm. you like so far out of him and McDonald? Where would you play? Who would you rank as number one and number two? Well, McDonald's still number one. He, you can't okay. get higher than making the country. And as a politician, McDonald's mm. was better. Yeah, I think that really and is what helps. Yeah, as a politician, McDonald's better. And also, it's not like any of McDonald's ideas were inherently awful. He just—he was too drunk to know what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> Right. And it, like again, railroad, like, good national policy at the time, good because you've got the American superpower below you. Yes, exactly. And like, yeah, McDonald was a racist, of course, but so was Mackenzie. Like, again, the Indian Act passed under him. Like, mm-hmm. it's not, it's not great. <laughs> like, no. Um, and the Northwest Mounted Police is, was explicitly created as a racist reaction, like the, 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 the precursor to the RCMP. So, like, there's a lot of shady stuff that we got into that we're going to get into in later episodes. Um, but yeah, I, I, I was thinking about that. I was like, is it almost, I, I was almost wondering if I could distinguish early McDonald and later McDonald. 
but even then, like I think McDonald is just too much of a powerhouse. I still, I still think between the two, he's number one. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, but just for his power, he is a strong apology. number two. Yeah, he is a strong Absolutely. number. Like, especially considering as we'll later talk about the other people who would succeed McDonald, I think he's going to stay at number two for a bit oh, yeah. <laughs> until he's until gonna... Laurier comes around. But... Yeah, Laurier is probably going to shoot. Laurier is probably Laurier is probably the top contender at this point to be number one. Yeah, like we'll see. Or at least to slug it out with McDonald. <laughs> Um, so yeah, like this, the only people I can see making it up to the point of fame or infamy of McDonald's is Laurier and the original Shudo. Yeah, I guess. And like, there's kind of a reason why, like, yes, he's number two now, but there's a reason why Mackenzie's not on the $5 bill. Yeah. Like he was he's fine. fine. No, he's not on the five the dollar bill. Oh, okay. Um, he like, he, he's fine, but he's, wasn't anything great. Well, again, he wasn't the myth. Yeah. Exactly. He wasn't, he, the, there's none of the famous quotes or anything, you know? Yeah, and funny enough. Still a good I, prime minister, though, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. I would, I would, I would between the two, I probably, like, putting myself back, I would probably have voted for him. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Like, it's, where, it's hard to say, like, back of the day, obviously. I don't agree with everything he stood for, but he did <laughs> some stuff. <laughs> I agree with his anti-aristocratic sentiments mm-hmm. and his voting policies and stuff. So... Any final thoughts that you wanted to add? Anything that you uh, wanted to end on, or is that enough for today? I think that's okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. How do you, uh, like, I don't know, the, the caricatures in this one weren't as fun, I feel, with the McDonald one. No. Well, McDonald, again, is just such a... How do I explain with McDonald? He's just such a legend about it, you know? Like, he's the myth. Right. He is the figure mm-hmm. that we turn to. Even his like his profile, you know, yeah. is just very well known. Yeah. Like you could recognize him. Pretty much anyone in Canada would probably. And the be fact able to that say he like could him. get away with being wasn't didn't he practice like he was incestual, wasn't he? Like he married a cousin. Or his second cousin. Yeah. Like he's an incestual. <laughs> it wasn't considered bad at the time. <laughs> that became prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. So. Next episodes, we're going to switch back more into a bit of a cultural realm. We're going to be talking a bit about sports. Just to kind of give us a bit of a pilot cleanser, I thought it would be kind of interesting to talk about in one episode, lacrosse and like Canada's, basically Canada's two national sports. One episode, lacrosse and like Native American um, sports and obviously hockey. Uh, So I think those will be two separate episodes. Uh, But yeah, we'll just take it a bit more laid back in those next ones and then get into the Northwest Mounted Police. Uh, Ooh, creation. Oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah. That's why I'm, I'm like I'm putting a bit of a buffer zone between <laughs> before like doing too much of a hard hitting thing with like Indian Act, John uh, um, Alexander McKenzie, and then Northwest Mounted Police. Like that's fine, but we can take a bit of a breather. I like the idea of doing like a special episode for each prime minister, though. Yeah, yeah, uh, because a lot of them we don't think of. No, I didn't know the names of like six prime ministers right. in total. Yeah. Um, and we'll see the ones following McDonald are very much among the ones that we don't remember. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be a very, every time we do this. So where would you rank them? Third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. <laughs> but it's like, yeah. Until we get to, I don't know, the William Lyon Mackenzie King, I guess. Yeah. Another Mackenzie. <laughs> Uh, we we Mackenzie's weren't made for built different. And then we'll get to Harper and it's like skyrocketed to number one. Oh my god. <laughs> no, no, Pierre Trudeau. Oof. Or when we when we finally get to our boy, Sir Wilfred Laurier. Yep. Or the Which, dinosaur, uh, Jean Chrétien. Oh yeah. The Shewinigan handshake. Can't wait to talk about that one. <laughs> <laughs> um all right. So Mac, where can people support us and reach out and do stuff? You can <laughs> share on Patreon and support us through there. You can That sigh was just like oh, I'm in Bermuda right now. I don't have time on... for this shit. Fine. Contact <laughs> us on Facebook through Twitter by email. Yeah. Great way to lodge complaints. We are happy to hear we're to be proven wrong. That's fine. We want to be proven wrong so we can get better. You can support us through PayPal and donate to the show what you feel we are worth. You can... There's so many ways, people. Like, just get in contact, spread the word, leave yep. a review on iTunes. We're a show that has grown mostly by word of mouth, and it gives us that special comfy feeling. So if you want to keep that going, then just tell us to your friends. Yeah. Tell them that it's fun, Canadian history. 
we're not that boring thing that you learn at school every year. Yeah. <laughs> Although, like we were saying, we, we, we somehow got people, we, we somehow were given, we're, we were somehow put in an assignment because we kept getting mm-hmm. like people from uh, uh, on our website that were sent over because apparently we were linked in an assignment on OneNote. So that's kind of cool. So yeah. Keep using us for school, even though we swear. Yeah. Hey, we are informed. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening. We'll see you next time with another episode of Historia Canadiana. Cheers, everyone. Mm-hmm. Cheers.